Let's do it. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to the next talk in this typesetting track. We have Simon Cousins with us, introducing us to Sile, a new typesetting system for creating beautiful printed documents. Let's give Simon a hand. Thank you. My name is Simon Cousins, and I wrote a typesetting system by mistake. Um, you know how it goes. In my, uh, in my copious free time, uh, I run a publishing company, you know, the way that people do. And uh, we publish a range uh, for popular level books, and also a range of academic books. Um, Academic books don't really need to look very pretty. A simple cover will do. But even a simple cover needs to be custom designed for the book. Uh, this is because books have different numbers of pages, which means the spine width is different, which means the whole size of the template is different. So even a really simple cover, you have to get it custom designed. And what you do is you go to the printer, you say, I've got a book with this many pages, and you get a template like this, usually a PDF or Illustrator template. And you have to fire up Illustrator, and you have to use a GUI. And who wants to use a GUI anyway? What we want to do, because we're you know, Unix hackers, is just write the information to a spec file, uh, fire up a Perl script, and have that generate the cover for us. So I looked around on the CPAN, uh, and I found a module that would help me to produce PDFs. Excellent. It even uh, has some methods for putting barcodes on the back. Well, I'm kind of almost there. The problem is that um, when you do a cover of a book, you usually want to put uh, a blurb, a description, on the back. Um, and because we are not Philistines, that, that blurb needs to be nicely justified. Uh, that's no problem. PDF API 2 has got a justify method. So I add that to my little Perl script, and uh, it looks like this. I ship it off to the printers, job done. A couple of days later, the book comes back from the printers, and I look very closely at it, and I see this. Uh, and, and this is horrible. You can't justify text like this. No way. You can't just squeeze letters together and call it justification. So this will not do. Now, at this point, if I had been a sensible person, I would have said, you know, how many academic books are we going to produce anyway? Probably not that many. I'll just suck it up and use Illustrator. We tried, but we failed. But no, I am not a sensible person. I'm a perfectionist. And I went out looking for a better text justification algorithm. Does anyone know where I might find a better text justification algorithm? Well, yeah, tech has got one. Uh, the problem with that is that text justification algorithm is 30 pages of extremely closely argued 1970s era Pascal. I'm not going to be digging into this. Here's a spoiler. Later in the evolution of style, I do actually face up to it and, and dig into this. But I go looking around and find that somebody called Bram Steen. Is Bram here today? I, I will find you. I will find you. Bram Steen has uh, translated this algorithm into JavaScript. Well, that's OK. I can understand that. I can't understand the algorithm, but I can understand the JavaScript. Uh, and from there, it's relatively easy to uh, port it into Perl, make a Perl module. And so I put this up on the CPAN. Uh, and while I'm digging around on the CPAN, I notice that somebody else has implemented the hyphenation algorithm from Perl, from, from tech, rather. Wonderful. I put both of these two modules into my cover generator. Uh, I run the script, uh, and now I am happy. It doesn't look like this anymore. It looks beautifully. Uh, justified, beautifully typeset. And I was happy. And then I had a thought. And I have to live with the consequences of this thought every day. The thought went like this. I've got some code which takes 
some textual input. It applies the hyphenation algorithm from tech. And then it applies the justification algorithm from tech. And then it produces a PDF output. I mean, I just need to add, I don't know, like a, a page breaking algorithm from tech or something. And, you know, how hard can it be? <laughs> Let's talk about tech for a moment. But before we do, I want to make sure that you understand style is not tech. It re really, 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 I'm not trying to write a tech replacement. Heck, I wasn't even trying to write a typesetting system in the first place. It just happened to me. Uh, but I want to talk about tech, because tech is um, kind of how most people have dealt with typesetting on computers. And it's a kind of way that people can get a handle on the problem space. So here we go. Let's talk about tech. Tech uh, has been an amazing piece of software. It's, it's probably one of the only pieces of software that I use that is older than me. Um, and when tech was being designed, uh, none of the things that we take for granted these days existed. So here's how tech works. It starts, uh, it takes your text, it puts it through a macro processor. That was a genius idea that you could have your document that would uh, uh, be programmable in a sense. Um, and when tech was being designed, there were no vector fonts. They didn't exist. So Don Kluert invented his own vector font format. And then he invented his own um, type metrics format. And PostScript and PDF didn't exist either. So he invented his own uh, document format. Brilliant. Absolutely amazing stuff. Um, it was written in 1978, 1979. It was rewritten again in 1982. And it's been essentially unchanged since then. Uh, Don made some brilliant design decisions way ahead of his, his time. The only problem with them is that, well, let's take Metafont, for example. Metafont didn't really win. Uh, as soon as PostScript fonts came out, people wanted to use PostScript fonts in tech. So one of the first changes to tech uh, was to allow you to use virtual fonts. Uh, Get rid of Metafont, use virtual fonts. Um, and then DVI, a brilliant file format, but DVI didn't win either. Actually, PostScript came along, and then PDF came along, and people wanted to use PostScript and PDF in tech as well. So the next major change in tech was to get rid of the DVI subsystem. Um, and then this whole thing about virtual fonts and text font metrics, that was a bit, bit tricky as well. People had libraries of fonts on their computer that they wanted to use. Uh, so the next major change to tech was to, to get rid of that as well and use your system font library. And that's where XE Tech came in. Um, and then, well, macro processing. Uh, macro processing didn't really win either. How many of you uh, have written M4? Yeah, configure scripts in M4. How many of you like it? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, macro processing, macro languages didn't, didn't really win either. Uh, what people do now is to embed a little programming language into their subsystems. And so this is how Lua Tech came along. Um, so the entire development of tech for the past 30 years has been removing all of the design decisions of Don Cluth that didn't stand the test of time. Um, and despite all that, we've still got the core of the dumb thing written in Pascal. So that's how tech works. Back to the story. I have uh, this program uh, that does kind of the same job. It's a bit shonky. The font support is not great. You have to load up the fonts manually, all this kind of thing. But it works. Um, and because I have a system that works, I do the sensible thing. I throw it all away and start again. This is something that you should do at least once with every programming project, especially if they're written in Perl. At this point, I'm not even sure why I'm doing this anymore. You know, I'm doing this kind of a, out of a sense of obsession and, and, and belief that it has to be useful somehow. Um, and I rewrite the, the whole system. Uh, this time, I write it in JavaScript. Uh, and I apply some of the things that, that I've learned. Uh, why JavaScript? Well, because somebody's already done the hard work of porting the tech uh, hyphenation and justification algorithms 
to it. So that's easy. Uh, we use Pango and Cairo to deal with the fonts and deal with the output. Um, and I add something called the frame abstraction, which I'll talk about later. Um, the input at this stage is XML. And this is style version 0.0.1. If you look back in the repository, uh, you will see this all written in JavaScript, which takes XML input. XML input does, looks like this. I should say at this point, it doesn't stop here. Yeah, it does change. Later versions have got a different input system. Later versions have got higher level primitives. But this is the kind of code that it was consuming. Why did I choose XML? Well, one reason is that I'm lazy, and writing passes is hard, uh, and I can't be bothered, and I just want to get something up and running, and, and XML is, it will kind of do. Um, but also, another reason is that I'm assuming these days that, that only a very small minority of us will be authoring documents in text editors. Not many people realistically do that, let's be honest. Most normal people will use some kind of a tool or they will have their data already in, a, in a, an XML format for some other reason. Um, and another positive reason, well, how many of you have ever tried to convert tech uh, files to some other format, some other market format, HTML, something like that? It's not a pleasant experience, mainly because the only thing that can correctly read a tech file is tech itself, and it's not wanting to give you HTML. So. I chose XML for those reasons. And again, I've got this toy typesetting system. And it works, but what on earth am I going to do with it? And then I met a guy called Martin. Uh, Martin works for uh, an organization called SIL. Uh, asked me afterwards how cool SIL are, because they're really cool. Um, and I first come across him on uh, a mailing list for a piece of software called Graphite. Uh, Graphite is very good at um, choosing the glyphs that you need in your fonts for multilingual uh, language processing, things like that. Uh, and it turns out it's written by this guy called Martin. Now, in a completely separate project, I have some dictionary data uh, that I'm trying to massage, and I want to put it into a standard format. So I look for, this is you know, linguistic dictionary data, I look for a standard XML format to store my dictionary data in. And I find one, I join the mailing list, and I find it's written by this guy called Martin. In a completely separate project, um, I'm writing an app for some sign language translators. And they want to uh, make notes on the translations that they've done. They want to get feedback from people and they want to mark up certain passages that need to be fixed or that the signing is a bit wrong, they want to do something different. Um, and there's a system that you can use called sign writing to write signs. I thought, oh, okay, we'll do that. I'm sure there must be a way of doing this in Unicode. So I go Googling for sign writing in Unicode, and I find a proposal to put sign writing into Unicode. It's not there yet, but somebody's got a proposal, uh, and it's the same guy. Um, it turns out Martin lives in Chiang Mai, uh, I was in Chiang Mai for a conference, and I emailed him and said, you know, we're into exactly the same stuff. Can we meet up and have a coffee? So I have a coffee with this bloke, and I said, Martin, what do you actually do? He said, well, I work for SIL, and I work on their typesetting team. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And he gets all the hard typesetting projects that nobody else knows what to do with. Um, I, mean, I was talking with him about tech, and, I was talking, and he said, well, we would love to use tech. Hey, we wrote our own version of tech. XE tech came out of SIL for this kind of stuff. He said, but we are getting to the end of what tech can do. It just can't do the things that we need. I said, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I've got something that might be able to help you. Tell me more about what these hard things are. So here are some of the hard things about Bible types, I think. First, you have the problem of multiple languages. Um, here are three Arabic letters. They have uh, Unicode code point 647 is the letter he. The problem is that you will never see those three letters written like that. Because when you write Arabic, it has to be joined up. And so each letter has got, reading from the right, again, just to make typesetting more interesting, reading from the right, you have your initial form, your middle form, and your final form. Um, 
Where it gets really interesting is that that's the case for standard Arabic. When you go to a different language, let's try the Sindhi language, the same code points, the same script, and even the same font has got a different processing expectation. It needs to look like this. And a different language, again using the same script, the same font, the same Unicode code points, needs to look completely different again. Languages are hard, and if anyone tells you that Unicode has solved the problem, they are lying to you. So, that's one thing that a, a, a world typesetter would need to do and do well. Now, thankfully, uh, there are some solutions to this. Graphite is one of them. A half buzz is a library that, that uses graphite for its shaping, and some versions of tech can do this. But that's just the start. Actually, as well as each language choosing its glyphs in a different way, each language has got certain conventions for how text should be set. So I live in Japan, uh, so Japanese kind of has to work in style. <laughs> um, how do you get Japanese text into paragraphs? Well, one thing that you absolutely can't do is use the same algorithm that you use for everything else, which is just to wait for a white space to come along and break on the white space. But there's no white space. So that's obviously not going to work. You need to have a, uh, a convention in your typesetter that understands Japanese. So you say, well, OK, how hard can it be? We just break on every letter. The problem is that uh, Japanese printers and Japanese typesetters, there are certain rules. You are not allowed to end a line on certain characters. You're not allowed to start a line, for instance, with a comma. That is not allowed. So, um, and similarly, uh, when you have two punctuation characters together, they need to be coined together. So your typesetter needs to understand the conventions of each language. Uh, here's what the output should like, look like, because uh, this is what Sile does. Um, tech can kind of sort of do this. There is a Japanese-specific version of tech that has these uh, rules built into it. But tech doesn't really solve the general problem. Another problem when it comes to Bible typesetting is that Bibles are big, thick things, and, and so they're, they're produced on very thin paper. And if you put ink onto very thin paper, it tends to bleed through onto the other side of the paper if you're not careful. So you need to make sure that your lines on one side and lines on the other side mesh together so that you don't see the text from the other side. Um, and the way you do this is to, to have a grid and make sure that each line starts at a fixed point on the grid. No problem. Text, tech can't do this very well. Context, uh, which is a kind of tech variant, that can kind of do it. Uh, but it gets worse. Uh, because with Bibles, you have footnotes, you have side notes, you other, have other things going on. The position of the side notes is very important. They have to start at or below the line that they refer to. Context starts to struggle at this point. Um, and then it gets really complicated because uh, the, the convention for Bibles is to have them in two columns. And another convention is that at the end of uh, a section or a chapter or a heading, anything like that, the columns have to balance. Um, and you may, at the bottom of your page, have some material that you can't split up. Uh, we can't leave the chapter header and cross-references on their own at the bottom. They have to be followed by some of the text, yeah? Uh, and we can't have the chapter header there, but not the cross-references. That would look ugly. So there's, there's a certain material at the bottom of the page that we can't split, and yet we have to find a way to balance these columns nicely. And the way you do that is look back on previous pages and adjust the space between the, the columns in the previous pages, between the paragraphs, uh, until you get to a nice point and you can balance the text nicely at the end. Tech can't do this at all. It just cannot do it. And the reason it cannot do it is because tech was designed 35 years ago. And 35 years ago, you did not have enough memory to keep very, uh, more than one page in memory at a time. So when you're making your page break decisions in tech, it's one shot. You make it, and it's done, and you move on to the next page. You can't look back over four or five pages and adjust the spacing. 
So at this point, you know, they, they can't use tech at this point. It doesn't work. They're using design, which is a great shame. But it gets worse. Because you might want to have your Bible in two languages. You might ha want to have English in one column and Greek in a different column. Uh, but you have to keep the, the points in sync, the verses in sync as you go down the page. Um, and of course, it gets worse again. Because you might want to have a two-column Bible, which is English on the left page and Greek on the right page. Uh, <laughs> this is completely impossible in any typesetting system that exists apart from one. So let's talk a, a little bit about how Sile can help with this. Here is uh, the design of Sile at the moment. Um, I sent that, that initial version 0.1 around a bunch of friends, and I got two main complaints. Uh, the, the feedback I got was, oh, JavaScript, and oh, XML. Um, and so I, I, I jiggled things about a bit. I, I think JavaScript's a fine programming language. Um, but that was not convincing people. Uh, and so I did a rewrite in Lua. Uh, Lua is a, a very interesting programming language. I'll talk about that later. The other main complaint, like I said, was uh, this XML only input. That was not going to fly with people. Um, one of the best pieces of programming advice I ever got uh, was from a guy I worked for called Tony Bowden. And he said that when you're implementing a subsystem, always implement it more than once. Uh, and have two or three different variations of that, because that tells you where the separation of concerns lies. Uh, and that's been very helpful. Every time I don't do this, I regret it, because I generally end up writing the subsystem multiple times anyway. Um, so you have a separation of concerns in your input subsystem. You can plug in an XML handler. You can plug in a sort of tech-like handler. I was talking to somebody today, and we might be working on a markdown sort of handler as well. Um, you have separation of concerns about what handles your fonts. Uh, it can use Pango, as the previous version did. Uh, it now uses font config, uh, which is a way of finding the fonts on your system, and half buzz, which is what I was telling you about earlier, shaping those international glyphs. Uh, two wonderful libraries which have next to no documentation. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, and you have a choice of output subsystem as well, uh, PDF libraries. I will talk about PDF libraries a bit later, but you might notice this one called LibTech PDF. That is the preferred output system from Sile. Uh, that is a new PDF library that I have abstracted out of tech uh, and I'm using for this purpose. We'll talk about some of the other things later. Um, I want to talk about this concept called the frame, because this is quite a new thing. Uh, new unless you've been using things like InDesign or any kind of graphical uh, DTP software. A frame is an area of the page where we can write stuff. Um, in Sile, there are two different types of frame. There are flowed frames, where content, can, content is going to go from one frame to the next frame to the next frame, and so on. And there are non-flowed frames. In this instance, you have two columns, which are flowed. If we get to the end of those two frames, we're going to start a new page. Uh, we have the bottom frame, and we have the table of contents frame, which are not part of the main flow of the text, and other things will write um, glyphs into them. How do we declare these frames? That was an interesting uh, issue. I ended up using something called Kasawari, which is a constraint solver. Uh, constraint systems are basically where you have a system of equations uh, or inequalities, um, x plus the width is 100. I want the width absolutely to be 90, so my x variable has to be more than 10. And it solves these problems for you. If you don't have that, and you're specifying your frames, let's say I want uh, a 3% width gutter between my two columns, then I have to do the math and work out, OK, well, I need to end 48.5% uh, of the way across the page this frame, 51% of the, the page that frame, which is OK for simple designs. And when you get more and more complicated, this doesn't scale. Uh, you need more flexibility. And so what you do in style is say, I want a gutter which has got this width. Um, and at the right of this frame, I have my gutter. And at the left of this frame, I have my gutter. And you sort out how wide it is. And you sort out where the frames go. And it will solve that. For instance, let's suppose I want to add footnotes. Um, in style, you put your footnotes into a separate frame. Uh, where you put that frame is completely up to you. You might want to have two columns with one footnote frame. 
You might want to have two columns with a footnote frame for each column. Or you might want to have two columns and have a footnote frame at the end of both of them. It's up to you. All you need to do is to tell Sile where the footnote frame goes relative to the other columns and how growing one frame will affect the other columns. Uh, and it will compute the positions of those frames when it's time to ship out the output. And this makes a lot of things really easy that are really tricky in tech. For instance, drop caps, you know, big, big capital letter at the beginning of your paragraph. When you want to do this in tech, there are, okay, there are packages which do this, but the way they do it is really ugly. They have to measure the size of your capital, and then they have to work out how much material can I now put on this line, and then how many lines thick can I make it, and then I put that in a box, I put that in a box, I put the two boxes together. Um, it's really, really simple if you've got frames, because in Sile, you can change the layout of the page while you're typesetting the page. I've been trying to find this somewhere in the tech documentation, it says. Of course you can't change the layout of the page while you're typesetting, because that would be really stupid. Actually, it turns out to be really useful. To do a drop cap in Sile, all I do is I write my big letter S, and then I say, I'm going to break this frame in half here, uh, and then I say, I'm going to break this frame in half here. And then I say, when you're finished on the top frame, move on to the bottom frame. And then all I do is go, just write some text into the frame. No problem. You don't have to compute anything. You don't have to uh, store anything into temporary boxes. It just works. The next thing I want to talk about is the embedded programming language. Uh, one question I get a lot is, so is style tech compatible? And I guess what people mean by that is, can I use my existing tech files without modifying them? It sounds like a sensible question. What they're actually asking, though, is, can I use all my LaTeX packages without modifying them either? And what they're actually, actually asking is, can I have this code run and have it work? No, you can't. And frankly, that's a feature. <laughs> Actually, you're... <laughs> and actually, you'll never have this code work anyway because there's a bug in it. Did you spot it? <laughs> actually, one of the lines should read expand after expand after expand after a group expand after the expand after tox expand after the tox one. Teltanto, who is speaking next, says that programming is an art practiced by only very devoted disciples. It, it's not a nice programming language. So what we do in Sile is that if you want to program it, you have to actually use a programming language. Um, that's a little bit extreme. I do provide a very, very simple macro uh, system. And in this system, you cannot take any arguments, and you can call process only once. So what you can do with that is deliberately very limited. So with this, we can define an M macro which changes the font style to italic. Deliberately very limiting. You can do quite a few things with it. Here's some of the table of contents code. So you can set up your header font, and you can redefine that, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but anything more complicated than that, and the system forces you to write Lua code. Uh, so here's uh, a package that will produce some dummy text. Let's say we've got a function in Lua that's called lorem, which, which produces some dummy text. Uh, and this hooks into that. You load up your script, and that defines a command called lorem, which will output and typeset some dummy text for you. Uh, why Lua? It's a good time to talk about why Lua. The, the typesetter itself has to be written in an interpreted language, uh, because I want to give you the ability to uh, modify how the typesetter operates while you're using it. And things like Lua Tech will give you hooks into the tech system. That's very helpful. But there's never one exactly where you want it. And unless there is that hook um, already predefined for you, uh, you're stuck. But with Sile, it's written in an interpreted language. You can redefine anything you like. Uh, we'll look at doing that a bit later. Um, I was doing it in JavaScript, Node.js, and now I have to in, uh, interface with all these C libraries for fonts and for PDF and all this kind of thing, and it was just a bit of a nightmare. 
Um, and the other thing is that Lua Tech already exists. So I already have this community uh, of people who care about typesetting and who are writing Lua. And I can, I, can, I can hook into that community if I can. So what does this give us so far? Have you ever tried going from doc book to PDF? Yeah, there's basically two ways to do it. You can go from XSL templates to uh, XSL TPROC to format objects through the hands of hell to Apache FOP, and that gives you PDF. Or the other way to do it is uh, DB Latex and then DB Demon Splier to be a nose, and then into Passive Tech and then PDF. Um, oh, it's not that bad, you might say. I mean, now there are scripts that will uh, do it for us. Have you ever tried customizing how the output looks? It's basically impossible. Style makes things so much easier. Uh, let me go back to, this has given up on me. Let me go back to the, uh, uh, some of the early XML input. You remember this? And in this, each XML tag is a style command. Yep. So if I want to do some doc book, uh, I, I take my doc book file. But before I take my doc book file, I load up a little bit of style, uh, which uh, says we're going to use A4 paper. We're going to use the doc book class. Um, and it also defines the kind of simple things that it's OK to do in the style macro language. It's OK to say that an abbreviation will be formatted in small caps. That's, that's easy. Um, and it loads this doc book class, and that's where we go into Lua. And that's where we define all the more tricky things. Um, for instance, if you're typesetting a link, uh, you typeset the content of the link, and then you do some brackets if there's a, a href, and you type that, side that, typeset that in a code font. Um, so your include files are written in the style macros, classes, and packages, always in Lua. Style is actually pretty small. Uh, the core of, of, of style is about 3,000 lines of, of, of Lua. Most of that, to be honest, being the, the justification algorithm, because that's really complex. Um, and most of the stuff which is done in the core in tech is actually an add-on package in style. Um, I mentioned the Japanese version of tech, Japanese p-tech. Uh, that is a language support package. Um, footnotes, which is a pretty key thing in tech, and insertions, are done outside of the core. They're done in a package, because we can modify the way that the typesetter operates. Bidirectional typesetting is done You know, when you've got Arabic, and then you've got bits of English inside that, and they have to go the other way around, and then Arabic inside that, that has to go the other way around. That's done as an add-on package as well. Uh, to me, that, that, that tells me I think I've probably got some of those separation of concerns right. And so how do we solve a problem in style? Let's take some of those nasty Bible typesetting problems that we have to solve. What you do is everything inside this gray box is driven by an object, the typesetter object. And you can subclass that object, and you can change some of the methods in it, and that changes how it works. So we have that problem with thin paper. We have to make sure that uh, lines on one side match up with lines on the other side. How do we do that? Well, we just take the method that adds vertical space uh, and make sure that space is quantized to our grid. Very, very easy. Um, column balancing, which you can't do very easily in, in tech because you can't look back over various pages. The way this works is, is in a sense, quite mind-blowing. Um, tech has this algorithm for breaking paragraphs into lines. Yeah? And that's a dynamic programming algorithm. And what we do is essentially turn that on its side and say, well, each page is a paragraph. And you work out now, using exactly the same algorithm, how to break, how to break the flow of text into pages. So it, it, we, um, again, somewhere in the, in the tech documentation, it says that you know, it would be great if we could use this whole uh, dynamic programming justification algorithm to do page breaking as well, but you know memory constraints, we can't do it. Well, we can now. Um, how do you solve a problem like the, the parallels and the diglots when you have a, a Bible in two languages? Well, this is really easy now. You have a typesetter object, and you have a second typesetter object, and they're both writing to the page, and they're talking to each other. And one of them saying, how far down the page have you got? Oh, I've got this far. 
oh, well, I need to stretch my, my paragraphs a bit further then. Oh, right, now I've got this far. Oh, right, we're in sync. I got an email the other day saying, how I really want to do four columns across a double-page spread. And we racked our brains up about how to deal with this. Um, and we, we found a great solution. We said, OK, put four frames on the same page. And, after, and then you do the same thing. You have four typesetters talking to each other. And after you output column one and column two, you do a physical page break. And then you put column three and column four on the next page. And it all balances, and it's lovely. I suppose I should show you some examples. Here's uh, an English and Greek uh, diglot where we are synchronizing as we go down the page. Here is um, a Greek New Testament. And here's that column balancing that I was talking about. We've got nicely balanced columns, even though we've got uh, a chapter break in the middle. This is a, a Greek dictionary. What's interesting about this is that it is automatically generated. There's something called the Perseus Project, which has a lot of uh, ancient Greek texts. And they're marked up with uh, cross-references to the English translation. Um, and they generated a big XML file using that correspondence. They generated a Greek dictionary uh, as an XML file. I loaded that XML file into Sile, uh, wrote a couple of commands for it to process the tags, and so you can now automatically process a dictionary. Somebody emailed me later uh, and said, ah, I, I'm trying to typeset Tibetan Buddhist scriptures. Um, and this is a nightmare because there are various things that are really tricky about them. Um, one is that the page numbers and the headings are all rotated 90 degrees. Um, and it's in Tibetan, so you have to know how to typeset and line break Tibetan. Um, and also the page numbers go in a kind of first to last, um, a very strange order. They go in a different order to, to Western scripts. So can we do that in style? Yes, we can. Um, I got contacted by some people who are uh, typesetting uh, an edition of the Bible, and it's got uh, side notes on one side, it's got side notes on the other side, it's got footnotes, it's got call-outs, it's got other stuff going on, and this is all done in style. And it's, it's not just religious text, don't worry. You can do it doc book or whatever you like in it as well. Um, what did I learn from this? Um, when I translated the code from uh, JavaScript to Lua, I don't see that as a rewrite. I mean, it was more just like a change of notation. Um, because the syntaxes of the languages are very similar. In fact, the syntaxes, let's be honest, of most languages are pretty similar. Maybe not Perl 6. What's interesting about programming languages is not the, 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 the syntax, but the built-in library and the tools that it gives you. Um, Lua gives you all the components that you need to create a really great programming language. And it's just my hope that one day somebody will do it. Um, PDF libraries, they all suck. That's what I learned about PDF libraries. Um, <laughs> that's why we now have a new one, which is um, the, the tech guys, it's not that you, okay, it's 30 years old as well. The tech guys uh, at a conference recently, they looked at all the PDF libraries. Maybe we should switch to using the mainstream open source PDF library. And they looked at them all and said, nope, none of them do what we need. And actually, the best solution we have is the one that we've already got. So one of the things I've been doing for Sile is actually taking that out of the tech system and, and creating a standalone uh, library, and I'm hoping that I can get that uh, merged back into the, the tech and the DBI PDF stuff. Um, but untangling the bits is quite tricky. Um, I learned that no matter how hard you try to uh, avoid clashes in packages, it cannot be done. Um, any system which can be uh, extended in multiple dimensions cannot uh, prevent a conflict between those extensions. I thought, you know, we're not going to have this thing where, where, where LaTeX packages conflict with each other. Yeah, we probably are, because we're going to have it even worse, because different packages are now rewriting different bits of the style typesetter itself. What else did I learn? Hacker News is very interesting. 
Early on in Soil's development, I had a visit from Hacker News. We got to number one in the, the Hacker News website for a day, and 3,000 hackers descended on the project. Out of which, I stopped reading the comments very early on, because that was, that was never a good idea. Um, but the impact of all these hackers depending, descending on the project was very interesting. I had one pull request, which was to add hyphenation support for Esperanto. The other thing that I need to, I learned is that I need to avoid buses. Um, Larry was talking about this earlier. Uh, the Perl 6 has a community of, of uh, designers and maintainers, and I've come to the realization that software is useless without community. And bad software with good community is going to beat good software with bad community every single time. Sometimes, uh, I know I have a kind of meritocratic attitude towards free and open source projects. I've written good code. There it is. It's your problem now. Uh, but it's not. I'm still responsible for, for building the community here, and I have to make the investment in, in a good website. I have to make the investment in, in good documentation and deliberately building the community uh, if I want Sile to be taken up. That's kind of why I'm here today. Um, so when I talk about the future of Sile, where are we going with this? We could talk about some of the technical goals. Actually, the core of Sile is pretty much feature complete. There are a few things that we need to add. Again, I said I live in Japan, so top to bottom typesetting really needs to work as well. Um, PDF outlines, so you can have PDF thumbnails, you can have all your headers in the PDF uh, do document tree. That needs to work, and I need to finish off uh, this process of splitting off LibTech PDF. But everything else, pretty much everything else, can be added with packages. Um, we need a package that gets that frame balancing correct. Uh, I need a package that, that will do a, a good implementation of tables, because tables are hard. I've done a simple one. Um, it would be great to have a full implementation of docbook and all the docbook tags and processing expectations for them. But I don't want to write too many more packages, because we also need to talk about the community goals. I think this is an important thing that, that free and open source projects need to get to grips with, is that having technical goals is not enough unless you have ways of building that community as well. Um, outreach is important. Before there will be another release of Sile, I would like to see five packages contributed by people <laughs> who are not me, basically. <laughs> and that, that's one of the goals that I have for the next release. To facilitate that, um, I'm putting a list of easy jobs on the GitHub wiki uh, that people can have a play with. And um, hopefully, we can see a lot more beautiful documents being typeset in the future as a result of this. Thank you all very much for coming. If anyone has any questions, I'm very pleased to take them, because I'm pretty sure I won't know the answer. Yeah. Yep. So tech has to be better at something. Um, math types, there's not all that much mathematics in the Bible. Uh, and what there is isn't particularly accurate anyway. Um, so I haven't done anything with, with math typesetting at the moment. Um, there is now, of course, MathJax is a mathematical layout system which is in JavaScript. And JavaScript and Lua are not that too dissimilar. So if you would like to see mathematical support in uh, Sile, then please port MathJax to Lua. It's probably not a hard job. Yes. Uh, for me, I have a question about footnotes. But for yes. me, uh, when reading about footnotes, are a problem. There is a lot of mess of this. And for me, I can distinguish three types of footnotes. Yep. The end of page footnotes yes. is for explanation to deep the, the issue, to make the, 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 the issue deeper. The second one is link footnotes, like you say in the, in the Bible, so yep. the, the cross reference and something like that. And the third one is uh, the bi bibli or bibliography or bibliography. Yep. Yep. And so I want to discourage when I write a, a book or even a text. Is it possible with style? Uh, so the question is, is it possible to distinguish between the three different types of book, book, uh, footnotes for explanation, for bibliographic information, and for uh, sort of deep, deeper 
uh, explanation. Uh, at the moment, with the packages that exist, there is one type of footnote which is just appears on a frame somewhere on the page. Uh, it is not difficult to write an EndNotes package, and that can be done. And uh, obviously, porting BibTeX is a bigger job, <laughs> but I'm hoping that will be done at some point as well. Um, what can it do for outputting other formats, thinking particularly of plain text so yep. you can grep things? So the question was, what am I doing about play, uh, other formats and outputting other formats? I am deliberately not doing anything about other formats. This is specifically for print output. Um, and I'm assuming that you're starting with plain text in the first place. Um, so I would like to see the processing done at that stage. So for instance, if you want an, e, um, an EPUB and a PDF, the way to do it is to start with the EPUB and then translate that to PDF. So do, do your processing before you hit style, and style is just going to help you get it into print. So silly question, why the name style? Does it stand for something? Um, it stands for Simon's Improved Layout Engine. Uh, I promise you, and I honestly swear to God, it is nothing to do with SIL. I chose the name before I, I came across this guy, Martin. Um, uh, it did stand for something else earlier, but I forgot what it was, and I backronymed it to Simon's Improved Layout Engine. In uh, LaTeX, you have sometimes uh, limitations on the amount of memory you can use. Yes. And that's a big burden for me. We can yep. create big documents. Yep. Uh, how does Sile go about that? Yep, uh, the question was, what does Sile do about memory limitations? Well, uh, again, tech being written 35 years ago used static memory reallocation for everything. Uh, Sile doesn't do that. So you are limited by the amount of virtual memory in your system. OK. No questions anymore? No. Well, if you do have any more questions, come and see me afterwards. But otherwise, thank you very much again for coming to us. Can I get a warm hand? Simon Cousins.